science as a way of thinking. How do we think as scientists? Let's talk about modeling right out the gate. Science deals with paradigms. The Cambridge Dictionary defines a paradigm as a model or a very clear or typical example used as a model. Wiki tells us in science and philosophy, a paradigm is a distinct set of concepts or thought patterns, including theories, research methods, postulates, and standards for what constitutes legitimate contributions to a field. This is a research methods class, and research methods create paradigms. Science, you see, is all about modeling reality. Science doesn't tell us definitively what reality is. It can't. You'll never really know what's out there. You'll never really know what's around you, not even in the immediate environment you're picking up now through your senses. Discussion of this uncertainty goes back to the earliest scientists and philosophers. Think of Plato and his parable of the cave found in the ancient Greek texts at the beginning of Western civilization. His idea of all of us metaphorically sitting in a cave, chained in place, facing a wall lit by a fire somewhere behind us, watching the shadows cast by figures between us and the flame that we can never see because we can never turn around and trying to figure out from their featureless 2D images and motions what richly detailed three-dimensional objects or creatures are casting these mere shadow representations of the real world. Think of the ancient parable of the blind men and the elephant found in ancient Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain texts of the Indian subcontinent each touching a different part of the creature and trying to pool their sensory data to form a composite image of the unknown being. Wondering what a rope, a tree, a snake, a wall, a fan, and a, a spear have in common. What sort of chimera can we construct that makes logical sense when we analyze this disparate data? This is science. The rigorous, disciplined, time-tested way we integrate and explain the data we collect from our flawed and imperfect senses to form a model of reality is the scientific way of thinking. Science is not about certainty. Science is not about proof. As pointed out in the Farnham Street Learning Community article on scientific thinking, quote, as odd as it sounds, in science, law, and many other fields, there is no such thing as proof. There are only conclusions drawn from facts and observations. Scientists cannot prove a hypothesis, but they can collect evidence that points to its being true. Lawyers cannot prove that something happened or didn't, but they can provide evidence that seems irrefutable at the time. The question of what makes something true is more relevant than ever in this era of alternative facts and fake news. A conclusion is either strong or weak, not right or wrong. Now this may confuse many, many students who came through improperly formulated school systems, the same systems that have led to the current crisis in public perceptions of science, and unfortunately led to a mistrust of scientists and worse, scientific theories about things like health and climate change. But science proves nothing. Its goal is to disprove flawed hypotheses, or rather to discover the flaws in previous models of the world and thereby enable better theories to be formed. Now that is science. People stuck in the unrealistic and politically charged modernist way of thinking, who used science as a way to justify colonial expansion, conquest of regions of potential resource and labor exploitation, the rampant unsustainable growth of extractive and polluting industries, and rapid, unplanned, profit-driven urban development have reacted with great disappointment to the notion that the true scientific way of thinking harbors no dogma. Science derives temporary authority from offering the best, least bad solution for the time being, but is always ready to throw a given model of reality out with the trash when a better model comes along. Good science does not play favorites or coddle its babies, Good science uses the scientific method to constantly poke at and joust with and question its own theories and destroy anything that no longer fits the improved data set. Science evolves mercilessly, rejecting its own hopeful monsters in the service of a better approximation of truth, but it never claims to own truth. It allows for no shibboleths, 
it simply continually rejects falsehoods. So let's talk about modeling. Here's a good definition of a model from the Business Dictionary that suits our discussion of scientific thinking. Quote, model, one, graphical, mathematical, symbolic, physical, or verbal representation or simplified version of a concept, phenomenon, relationship, structure, system, or an aspect of the real world. The objectives of a model include, one, to facilitate understanding by eliminating unnecessary components, two, to aid in decision-making by simulating what-if scenarios, three, to explain, control, and predict events on the basis of past observations. Since most objects and phenomena are very complicated, have numerous parts, and much too complex, parts have dense interconnections, to be comprehended in their entirety, a model contains only those features that are of primary importance to the model maker's purpose. Models range from simple sketches to computer programs with millions of lines of code, but all of them have one thing in common. Some elements of the actual thing are abstracted or mapped, see mapping, into the model. Models are divided into three classes on the basis of their degree of abstraction. One, iconic model, least abstract physical look-alike model, such as a model airplane or train. Two, analogous model, more abstract, but having some resemblance to what it represents, such as a chart, graph, map, network diagram. Three, symbolic model, most abstract model, with no resemblance but only an approximation to what it represents, such as a mathematical equation or formula, financial statement, language, a set of accounts. See also mental models. Now your job as students of science is to develop a facility in developing and utilizing and discovering the flaws in and improving models. Every time you make a presentation and present a graph or chart or map, you are modeling. And perhaps most insidiously, at times dangerously, you're trying to convince your audience that your model, or the model you're presenting, is a better representation of the facts than any other. You choose and use your models to fulfill an agenda. But as Yale professor James C. Scott famously pointed out in his seminal book, Seeing Like a State, How Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed, quote, the map is not the territory, end quote. The maps you use contain all sorts of biases and assumptions and agendas, depending on what level of granularity they have and what you include and what you leave out. The charts and graphs are all abstractions. You have an agenda, whether you admit it or not. That we as scientists manipulate our models for our own purposes, consciously or unconsciously, was hammered home to us by Thomas Kuhn in his important and endlessly controversial scientific philosophical treatise Quote, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, published the year I was born in 1962, but with far-reaching implications for my life and all of us who have lived to see its impact on the world half a century or more later. The book introduced the now famous idiom paradigm shift to the world and caused us to question the political projects inherent in the use of science. As Wikipedia synopsizes, quote, Kuhn made several notable claims concerning the progress of scientific knowledge that scientific fields undergo periodic paradigm shifts rather than solely progressing in a linear and continuous way, and that these paradigm shifts open up new approaches to understanding what scientists would never have considered valid before, and that the notion of scientific truth at any given moment cannot be established solely by objective criteria, but is defined by a consensus of a scientific community. Competing paradigms are frequently incommensurable. That is, they are competing and irreconcilable accounts of reality. Thus, our comprehension of science can never rely wholly upon objectivity alone. Science must account for subjective perspectives as well, since all objective conclusions are ultimately founded upon the subjective conditioning or worldview of its researchers and participants." End quote. The over introduction of subjectivity into science and our assessment of it coincided neatly with the deep suspicions of the postmodern and deconstructivist philosophies that were gaining ground in the post-colonial era, and we must say irritated a lot of people who were benefiting from the status quo of 
Western hegemonic rule. While the response of scientific thinkers was to try and include an ever larger representation of blind people around the elephant in the room, so to speak, through expanded science education programs that would include formerly marginalized researchers and participants so that an even better model of reality could be formed through inclusion of their objective and subjective perspectives, the response of many political elites was to use Kuhn's insights to throw the entire scientific enterprise into disarray by getting the public to believe that because science is done by people and people can have flawed perceptions and political agendas, then science can no longer be trusted. There are scientific ways to study this phenomenon. They're called political economy and political ecology. See, by including anthropological, sociological, psychological, and political perspectives as ever-widening data sets for modeling a more inclusive reality, these fields create models of the world that are arguably more complete than any models that disinclude these perspectives. As you learn in our systems thinking and nexus classes, we need more holistic perspectives to understand complex systems. Any model that's oversimplified, that contains an unthinkingly reduced subset of the whole, is going to amplify biases and corrupt the model or limit its explanatory power. As you will study in Module 3C, Data Construction and Analysis, deciding what to include in any given model and how to determine what constitutes relevant data and meaningful analysis takes quite some training and practice and deep thinking. It, of course, isn't as simple as collecting measurements of things and then making graphs. So as we embark on this journey, this journey into science as a way of thinking, we need to start with this fundamental understanding that science is about making ever more faithful models of reality, that all models are fundamentally flawed and imperfect, but that the scientific method gives us tools to continually improve the models, to include more parts of the incomprehensible whole, and to decide when and how to simplify them so as to make them meaningful and allow for the necessary paradigm shifts that can move humanity forward towards sustainability. Now, we could simply talk about various paradigms and their strengths and weaknesses and our explanation of how to think scientifically and hope that you trust us, but that would be dogma. As usual in bad science education, for the sake of expediency in a time-limited environment, particularly those that teach to the test, we could skip having you go through the inductive and deductive reasoning necessary to, quote, make broad generalizations from specific observations, that's inductive bottom-up, and to, quote, go from a general case, usually a hypothesis, down to a specific instance, that's deductive top-down reasoning, we could ask you to take our word for what constitutes scientific thinking and let that be that and then quiz you on it. But that would rob you of the opportunity to engage in true scientific thinking and undermine our entire cause for sustainability. Fortunately, the age of information technology and its creation of the internet and enabling of the cause of citizen science has caught up with our need for ever greater participation in science and more faithful modeling of reality. By handling the complex math and visualization issues, software and hardware in the 21st century facilitates the much needed new paradigm shift that could finally democratize science so that it cannot be so easily politicized. The low transaction costs of building models and running experiments in the virtual reality of a computer simulation makes it possible for all of us to really practice our inductive and deductive reasoning skills, to perform meaningful experiments that point us closer to truths and away from fake news, and to present our findings in ways that can inspire others to sharpen their own models of truth and possible outcomes for our actions. My own strong opinion on how to adopt science as a way of thinking and get really good at it is that in addition to reading about it and thinking through it and discussing it, you jump right into the world of modeling the world and start experimenting. Climate scientists are using the data we have and the information technology tools we have and creating models of possible futures, what-if scenarios, that will have tremendous impact on our lives. Meanwhile, politicians are declaring that these models and the conclusions we draw from them are hoaxes. A popular revolt against the experts 
is affecting our actions. So isn't it time we all became not just scientifically literate, able to read and understand what the scientists are saying, but scientifically adroit, able to do the kinds of modeling and thinking that scientists use, and thereby able to draw our own conclusions? And the great news is that it is actually super fun. The same sorts of modeling tools that scientists use to try and disprove falsehoods in our perceptions of reality are also being used by the entertainment industry to create compelling and exciting fictions for video games and movies. Once you start playing with world building and reality modeling, and once you experience the power of today's computer technology to play with data for yourself, your own inborn inductive and deductive reasoning capabilities will kick in and you should find the scientific way of thinking easier and easier to employ. As a starting point, I suggest you start right out the gate by jumping into four very powerful open source, read free, software tools for modeling and data visualization that we will introduce you to in this class. One is R, the open source statistical package, because statistics is the most powerful method we have for evaluating the strength of our models of reality. Another is QGIS, a powerful open source mapping and data layering tool. A third is Blender 3D, a powerful physics engine, mesh modeler, and animation program that likes to take QGIS data and manipulate geometries and build worlds. And a fourth is Unity 3D, a game engine that lets users create worlds by combining computer code and graphic elements and make the modeled reality playable and interactive. These are just a few of the many options there are out there for developing your abilities as a researcher in sustainability science. The point is that we need more of us blind folks around the elephant sharing our models, and that computers can help us turn our heads around in Plato's cave using their powerful math for statistics and visualization so we can see, sometimes literally, what has heretofore been hidden from us so that we can make better decisions and achieve liberty and justice and true sustainability for all.